Hey, I'm Rafael Pieri. I'm a debater at the University of Michigan. And prior to that, I debated at Monte Vista High School in Cupertino, California. Welcome to Debating Soft Left Framing When Affirmative. This lecture will cover all of the essentials and hopefully a bit more for what you need to know when crafting your framing contention and debating framing arguments with the soft left app. On Sunday evening, Scott Phillips, a debate coach at Dartmouth College, will cover the negative component of this lecture, so make sure you check that out. Before we dive into the mechanics of debating soft left framing, we need to define what a soft left app is. We can do so pretty easily by looking at two other types of affirmatives. First, the critical or KF, which can be defined as a non-traditional affirmative that does not defend a topical plan. Second, the policy AF, more precisely a big stick policy AF, a traditional affirmative that defends a topical plan. The soft left AF is the permutation of these two genres, hence the name soft left. It is left of the policy AF, but right of the critical AF. Thus, a soft left AF is an affirmative that defends a topical plan, but non-traditional impacts. Soft left AFs follow a predictable structure, advantage and framing. This advantage, though, is pretty distinct from your usual run-of-the-mill policy app. Instead of pointing to several distinct impacts that result in a nuclear war or existential catastrophe, the soft left app emphasizes one discrete, solvable harm. In the context of some of the camp files that have been turned out, this can range from capital punishment to CODIS DNA databases to immigration detention centers. The soft left AF also argues this harm is indicative of broader systemic violence. Capital punishment props up racism, CODIS supports eugenics, and immigration detention centers are an instrument of xenophobia. Lastly, as with any policy AF, only the plan solves that harm. Solvency is particularly important with the soft left AF, given the emphasis the 1AC is going to place on probability, which means having a well-developed solvency claim is imperative when writing a soft left affirmative. The bulk of soft left aft debating, however, occurs in the framing contention, where the soft left aft argues for a fundamentally different paradigm of assessing arguments and their relative risk. First, the soft left aft argues that we should adopt a specific ethical framework, which we'll cover in a moment. Second, the soft left aft explains how we should assess risks based on certain guidelines and cognitive biases. And lastly, the affirmative argues the negatives impacts are wrong from a magnitude perspective. There are three broad categories of soft left framing. This lecture will cover all three. It will give the three a grade, a green thumbs up for good, a yellow thumbs middle for neutral, and a red thumbs down for bad. And then it will cover specific arguments which will also be graded and we'll go through some examples of cards and make some recommendations. The first category is ethics. Ethics means the moral principles that govern how we should act. It refers both to frameworks for action and to criticisms of disadvantages, i.e. a soft left AF might say the base ad is racist or the terror ad is securitizing. Second is risk assessment or how we should prioritize impacts based on probability or magnitude. You can think of this like soft left impact calc. Since the AF has forfeited their right to an extinction impact, the soft left AF will make alternative impact calculus arguments to get back on equal footing. Third and finally is impact defense, which is really just the 1AC's way of baking in a longer 2AC to answer 1 and C disadvantages. It includes a series of casual answers that are designed to mitigate the negatives, risk, and magnitude of a disadvantage. The first category is ethics. I have graded ethics with a thumbs down. I think it is the least important of the three categories that I'll, that for reasons that I will get to later. Ethical paradigms are philosophical prescriptions that soft left AF argue we should adhere to and that we should reject any actions that fall outside of those ethical boundaries. One such ethical philosophy is deontology, which is a set of philosophical maxims that dictate actions are either strictly good or strictly bad according to a clear set of rules. For instance, racism, lying, theft, and murder might all be outlawed under deontology. And if something is a deontological rule, then there is no instance of that thing that can ever be justified. This is actually part of the way that we get the phrase D rule in debate, deontological rule or deontological decision rule. Next is virtue ethics. This is almost never used in debate, but virtue ethics is a branch of normative ethics that says that people should embody values and these values correspond to certain virtues. An ethical or excellent individual will have the right characteristics displayed. 
Next is utilitarianism, which is the philosophy most in vogue for contemporary debate. Utilitarianism says that we should maximize the greatest good for the greatest number. There are two delineations of utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism, which prescribes taking the action that maximizes the greatest good for the greatest number. And rule utilitarianism, which says that it's too onerous for us to decide whether any action in any circumstance corresponds to the greatest utility. And so instead, we should have a series of rules that if we universalized across society would be good. For example, we could universally have a prohibition against state-sanctioned murder because if that was applied generally, the world would be better and it would improve relative to the status quo. Both those subsets of utilitarianism can be divided into two additional components. Classical utilitarianism says that we should compare how good something is to how bad something else is. So if action X generates five utils of positive utility, but four utils of negative utility, action X is more good than it is bad. Negative util disagrees. Negative util says that suffering is always worse than pleasure is good. One hour of torture is far, far worse than several days of ice cream or whatever pleasure you want to choose. Essentially for negative util, good and bad are like distinct currencies that can't be transferred and the bad currency is always worth more than the good currency. Consequentialism is a bit separate from these ethical philosophies because any of them can accept or reject consequentialism. But the idea behind it is that the morality of an action is solely judged based on its consequences or its effects. The principle of intervening action is essentially non-consequentialism and it features in our first example, the Harris 8 card, which is frequently read in soft left framing contentions. Harris argues that we should be non-consequentialists because we either have to consider zero consequences or infinite consequences. It's illogical and arbitrary to consider four consequences or 19 consequences. But considering infinite consequences is theoretically limitless and it makes decision calculus impossible because we never know where to cut off the chain. It's impossible to determine if an action is good or bad since we haven't considered every possible consequence that emerges as a result from it. Instead, the only option is to discount consequences entirely and judge our actions solely on their intrinsic moral worth. Any other position would have to condone deplorable actions like terrorists forcing someone to torture a civilian lest they risk launching a nuclear warhead at New York. The consequentialists would have to say that unethical actions like terrorism or torture were the more ethical choices in that context. Whereas the principle of intervening actions says that it is the intervening actions, i.e. in this case, the terrorists that are held responsible for unethical behavior, not the person responsible for the initial action. Thus, we are only responsible for the action of the plan, hence the tag. I think this argument is ultimately unpersuasive and merits a thumbs down. Soft left affirmatives clearly defend consequences. They read an advantage that is premised off of the implementation of the plan and how this changes the status quo. Soft left apps can link turn or impact turn disadvantages, another argument that relies on consequences. Their framing argument says that focus on existential risks is bad because it causes bad things, another consequentialist argument. And if soft left apps abandon consequentialism, the negative can beat them on presumption by proving solvency is a consequence of the plan. Our next example is a broader critique of utilitarianism. This card by Santos argues that the logic of utilitarianism culminates in extinction and genocide because we naturalize levying violence against less fortunate minoritarian populations to secure the interests of a cruel majority. And in so doing, we defeat the purpose of utilitarianism and result in discardable populations that become sacrificial lambs for supposedly beneficial actions. I think this argument is better than non-consequentialism. That said, I still don't think it's great. Utilitarianism is an extremely logical claim that is closely linked to any negative disadvantage. Most two ends would relish when given the opportunity to defend utilitarianism. And I think it's more strategic to make it so the AF just doesn't disagree and is compatible with the negative arguments about utilitarianism. It's a slippery slope to genocide to say that any one life is more important than another. And so it's intuitive that we should try to spread out good as much as possible amongst as many people as possible. There are some specific critiques of utilitarianism involving identity groups such as indigenous individuals or racial minorities that have been historically targeted by quote unquote utilitarian policies. But these critiques kind of lose their persuasive weight because the negative is dealing with existential risks that encompass and surpass the combined total of all of these groups.
So we've covered two of the bad ethics arguments, or at least ones that I don't think are worth including. What are some of the good ones? One of the better ethical arguments is an endorsement of rule utilitarianism. This says that the 1AC follows a rule that if generalized would maximize the greatest good for the greatest number. The strategic component of rule utilitarianism is that you, you are able to say that any ethical violation or, or any broaching of this rule is unacceptable. So if you have a rule against racism or a rule against state-sanctioned murder, you can reject any DA or any counterpoint that engages in any amount of those things. It's more persuasive than deontology, though, because rule utilitarianism is still premised on increasing aggregate utility. The argument is simply that it would be too morally complex to evaluate whether every individual action would increase or decrease utility. But empirically, we can derive a set of rules that would inform us for what the world would look like if they were universalized across the world. The other option is just sticking to act utilitarianism, which is the basic util logic that informs most DAs. We should just take actions that are better than they are bad, that maximize the quality of life relative to the status quo or a competitive alternative. This might seem a little intimidating, but arguments from category two, risk assessment, which we'll go to next, demonstrate that the soft left F can be utilitarian even without directly solving an existential risk. Other ethical arguments tend to be tautological and give the negative a link to too much offense, i.e. how it's too easy for the negative to say util good. Deontology suffers from the opposite problem or a similar problem, but opposite in the sense that while util good may be so obvious, deontology is so convoluted and difficult to justify that there are academic tomes dedicated to laying out complex philosophical precepts and defining principles for when our philosophical rules come into contravention. It's really hard for the act to do all of that. And it makes no sense why we should only have a deontological rule against racism and not against any other morally deplorable action. The negative can also introduce their own deontological rules, like a presumption against extinction or a presumption against nuclear warfare, which make their own ethical sense. Here's an example of a rule utilitarianism argument. This Bessler evidence is making the case that we should generally enforce a presumption against state sanctioned murder. I think this argument is reasonable. I'm neutral on it. It depends on debater preference and quality of the affirmative, but it makes a lot of sense for an act like the Death Penalty Act, which wants to follow a principle of human dignity and opposition to torture. So that sums up ethics. The next section of soft left framing is what I think is the most important. And consequently, it earns, a, it earns a big thumbs up for me. Risk assessment. Risk assessment is an alternative to traditional probability times magnitude framing or a reason why the soft left aft still wins under probability times magnitude framing. So you might have heard the phrase probability floors or probabilistic versus possibilistic thinking. And both of those are indicts or additions to probability times magnitude. Probability floors says that we can only consider an impact once it meets a bare minimum probability. If it's below that probability, we shouldn't even consider it no matter how high the magnitude is. Probabilistic thinking says that we should consider impacts that are probable or have a given probability, whereas possibilistic thinking says that we should consider exigent possibilities as well. And we'll sort of analyze the details of those two more precisely in a moment. When debating risk assessment, soft left, af soft left afs also tend to point to a number of biases that they will say make systemic or soft left impacts underestimated and extinction impacts overestimated. One such bias is a conjunction fallacy. The conjunction fallacy explains that risk is multiplicative. Additional details decrease probability. A highly specific story sounds believable, but in reality, a more general story is more believable. Think of it like the likelihood that I got a haircut in the last month versus the likelihood that I got a haircut on the third Wednesday of May. Good story bias is similar. Narratives are more persuasive when they're woven together with a long convoluted frame and they're more persuasive than their probability would suggest, which means we tend to artificially elevate the likelihood of a disadvantage if it's presented to us in a cohesive story. Next is infinitarian paralysis, the argument that calculating with infinite risk a number infinity, namely extinction, is impossible because it makes any mathematical calculation irrelevant if extinction is equivalent to infinity, you can take a 99% probability of solving extinction and multiply it by infinity. The result, infinity. But you can also take an 0.003% probability of solving extinction and multiply it by infinity. The result, infinity. How do you choose? 
The infinitarian paralysis argument says that you can't. Next is negativity bias. Negative outcomes resonate more than positive outcomes. The story of someone's dog being run over by a car is sadder than the happiness of someone getting a new puppy. Predictions fail is another common argument. Nonlinearity, chaos theory, butterfly effect, these are all phrases that you may have heard used in this context. Nonlinearity simply means that we can't predict things in a linear fashion, i.e. X causes Y, Y causes Z, Z causes W. Chaos theory is essentially another phrase for the same thing. And then the butterfly effect refers to the phenomenon where a butterfly flapping its wings can actually influence the pattern of hurricanes in other countries due to a series of unpredictable chain reactions. Lastly, the soft left half can also generate offense against existential risks. They can argue in favor of maximization through moderation. They can say structural violence comes first or that their impact root causes the next impact, or they can say the next impact pushes their impact to the back burner. And we'll discuss those at length in a little bit. So here's our first example of risk assessment, structural violence first. This evidence by Tomas Zentis says that structural violence is the root cause of extinction and invisible wars make us sort of desensitized to ongoing violence and disruption all around us, which means that it becomes easier for us to start visible wars. Therefore, structural violence is the basis for war and root causes and negatives impacts, meaning we should prioritize solving it before existential risk. I don't think this argument is especially persuasive for two large reasons. First, is it implicitly concedes sufficiency framing. The affirmative cannot solve all structural violence. Therefore, by making this argument, the app has said solving some structural violence is enough. This supports the negatives arguments about counterpoint solvency and makes it difficult for you to leverage the full weight of your framing. Second, the disadvantage will often have a larger internal link. Imagine debating the CODIS AF, which is about DNA samples and the retention of profiles, and you say structural violence first, and then the negative gets to go for the elections disad, where they can point to any systemic violence caused by Trump and simply say that outweighs the AF and accesses your framing. Another example is infinitarian paralysis. This is a pretty frequently read soft left framing card. I actually read it myself in high school by Oliver Kessler. Kessler argues that we can't factor a probability in an acceptable manner if we allow for infinite mag magnitudes for the reason that I explained earlier. Probability becomes irrelevant because any amount of improbability or risk still equates to infinity since that's what the loss is set at. Risk management becomes impossible. Catastrophes are theoretically infinite and no action can be taken. This argument is decent. It's very good if the negative defends that extinction is an infinite impact. But as Scott might talk about in his lecture, they don't need to. The negative can simply say that extinction is equivalent to 7 billion lives, or they can say it's equivalent to 7 billion lives plus a set number of future generations. There's no need for them to defend infinity, and consequently, then they can often no-link the infinitarian paralysis. So based off of what we've talked about and based off of the examples of the cards that I just gave, I think the best risk assessment arguments are as follows. I think the soft left affirmative should always try to establish a probability floor or win the claim that a sufficiently low risk is equivalent to no risk. The soft left daft should push heavily in the conjunction fallacy, which as explained earlier, is the argument that disadvantages represent accumulation that multiplicatively reduces probability. If you assess uniqueness at 80%, link at 80%, internal link at 80%, another internal link at 80%, and an impact at 80%, you might think the DA overall is at 80%, but in reality, you have to multiply each of the 0.8 values, getting you to a disad of less than a third in likelihood. And if you're debating a soft left half well, you should win there are far, far more than five parts to a DA. There are theoretically hundreds. The affirmative should also make the infinitarian paralysis argument, as just explained with the Kessler card, but this is contingent on the negative spotting that extinction is an infinite risk. And if they do not, the affirmative should be comfortable jettisoning this argument and not advancing it further. Predictions fail is another strong F argument. Nonlinearity mean that international relations and politics are prone to intervening actors and unpredictability. Studies prove that pundits really can't prove anything more than just monkeys throwing darts at a dartboard. And international relations theorists have been arguing for decades over who can accurately predict how the international order functions. Now, it's important to read these cards only where they make sense. If your affirmative relies on a complicated solvency mechanism with lots of political interplay, or if it's the arms sales topic and you're reading a soft left app that 
has to do with another country's response to the plan, I wouldn't recommend making predictions fail. The affirmative should also try to leverage offense against existential risk. Maximization through moderation is one example of this. Existential risk philosophers like Nick Bostrom argue that we should prioritize tail end risks. We should look at risks that are the most disparate and focus all of our efforts and resources to resolving them accordingly. The maximization through moderation approach argues for what they term an indirect approach to existential risk, where we try to decrease the likelihood of existential catastrophe through marginal and incremental improvements in quality of life. One way to think of this is a world that is marginally more democratic, marginally less racist, marginally more judicial, marginally more equal, is also a world that is less likely to feature existential catastrophes or extinction events. Think of maxima maximization through moderation as the reason why a disadvantage would not be persuasive against the soft left daft if you voice it as a real objection. Soft left daft tend to be some of the truest affirmatives in debate, where they're good ideas were you to pass them with the magic wand of fiat. And the reason for this tends to be maximization through moderation. Pascal's wager is the famous philosophical example of the argument that you should always bet on religion, because if you don't believe in God, you might be damned to hell. If you do believe in God, you will, you'll, you'll be spared. And even if you believe in God and there is no God, there's no consequence to your belief. Some philosophers like Munth argue that Pascal's wager is an analogous argument to existential risks because we cartoonishly overlook any other possibility and sacrifice huge improvements to quality of life or mitigations to systemic violence in exchange for incredibly insignificant and overly specific reductions in existential risk. One example of what I think is definitely a good framing argument is the conjunction fallacy. This card by Carl Canetta, I believe was originally cut by David Haidt, though I'm not sure about that, and is fantastic at using the rhetoric straight from the disadvantage. Phrases like far-fetched scenarios, each step, highly selective view of the future, non-zero probability, impossible standard of defense, etc., the argument that this card makes is that disadvantages are reliant on a series of omissions. The negative never tells you the internal links that are necessary for their dissent to work. But if you were to expose those internal links and take the probability of them and then multiply that probability, you would get a very, very low risk of the disadvantage indeed. This is another argument, an interesting angle that we haven't really talked about so far, that I've termed a probability ceiling. The argument that probability ceilings make is that there's a definite cap that no disadvantage can overcome. There's a certain number at which point no DA can be more probable than that number. This Simpson card takes a pretty extreme view and says that the cumulative risk of every dissat is capped at 0.2%. That's because Simpson does a Bayesian reformulation of the doomsday effect, which essentially is the probability that human humankind would go extinct in a given year. Simpson concludes, based on a review of the literature, concluding various factors that are likely to increase or decrease existential risk, that we have about an 0.2% per year global catastrophic risk. So the argument the affirmative wants to advance is that no disadvantage can exceed more than 0.2, and they're probably way smaller than 0.2, because a disadvantage that was 0.2 is equivalent to the entire existential risk for that year. This argument is ultimately okay. It's very tricky, and it means that even if you drop a disadvantage, for instance, the judge should not put the disadvantage higher than 0.2%. So there's a lot of strategic upside to this argument, but it does have some major flaws. Namely, it doesn't assume the disadvantage. So in a debate that I judged earlier in the week, one team, the negative, argued that this card wasn't predictive enough because it didn't assume Trump. And the whole point of the disadvantage was that Trump was a unique source of existential risk outside of traditional risk calculus. So... The short and not super predictive nature of Simpson means it's not a perfect argument, but the strategic upside means that it might be worth including. Another example is the argument about existential moderation. You can see where the phrase an indirect approach to lowering extinction comes from. It's in the middle of the card. And Patrick Kaczmarek advocates for the philosophy that I described earlier. We should seek to mitigate existential risks by decreasing structural violence and systemic oppression and improving individual lives such that the quality of life as a whole increases. This argument also relies on the butterfly effect, which is the idea that small actions can have unpredictable ripple effects 
The fact that these effects are unpredictable means we shouldn't consider the disadvantage, since it's equally likely that it's not true, and every life saved may end up saving an existential catastrophe. I think this is one of the stronger arguments to include in your 1AC framing contention, and this card in particular is reasonably strong at articulating it. This takes us to the third and final category of soft left framing, impact defense. Impact defense is ultimately a medium argument. It's okay, and I think you should include some in your framing contentions, but it will never get you very far. Impact defense is not strictly related. In soft left terms, it just means a catch-all answer to negative disadvantages, so it, it could include presses about uniqueness or link uniqueness, for instance. The most common impact defense argument is no war. The argument that states that in a nuclear war or one that involves several great powers is unlikely, probably prohibitively so, because of mutually assured destruction, economic interdependence, democracy, institutionalism, etc. A subset slash related argument to no war is no extinction, which says that even if there were a war, it would not be of sufficient intensity to extinguish the species. Many authors like Cotton Barrett say that only 4,000 nuclear warheads launched and making impact would be enough to wipe out humanity. So that warrant coupled with the argument that militaries would counterforce or just target militaries, not civilians, plus the argument that no one has an incentive to launch a nuke in Australia since it's isolated, and the same thing is true for island populations, all work to bring down the probability of a nuclear war causing extinction. Impact defense is often maligned. For some, judge, for some reason, judges really don't like this argument, even though I think it's fine. You should think of impact defense as a longer 2AC to a disadvantage. You're essentially including some of your 2AC arguments in the 1AC. Impact defense should be structured for broad applicability and include no contradictory claims. You should also be careful defending that a particular set of factors prevents a nuclear conflict because the negative can be a disadvantage to those factors. If you say there's no great power war because economic interdependence means that we don't go to war with our trading partners, then you've guaranteed the impact to a negative trading DA. So you have to pick your impact defense carefully. Here's the first example of impact defense. No miscalculation. Krypton 17. I've seen this card read on multiple occasions and I've even read it myself. It's a pretty good no miscalc card. But the problem is this is not traditional impact defense. It's soft left impact defense. And so this argument is unpersuasive. Just ask yourself, what percentage of disads actually have a miscalc impact in the 1 and C against the F? If the negative reads one that has one, you can read it in the 2 AC. But for the 1 AC, you want no war arguments that are as broad as possible. Thus, I like this one, Betweiss 17. Betweiss, the famous hedge bad author, gives a bunch of reasons why great power conflicts are obsolete. The point Betweiss is making is that hegemony is not what caused those powers to stop fighting. But that's enough for our defensive arguments to still make sense. Fetwise points to mutually assured deterrence, points to modern integrated markets and economic interdependence, it points to democracies, regimes, laws, and institutions. So I think this makes sense as your sort of catch-all, no impact, no risk of war, and it lets you mitigate the disadvantage substantially as of the outset, because whatever warrants you don't interact with can simply become the basis for your critiques of their impacts. So what is the ideal framing contention? Well, in my opinion, the ideal soft left AF should include framing arguments from all three categories. The one exception to this is when you're defending act utilitarianism, you don't need an ethics argument because it's presumed to be the default and the negative will probably waste a bunch of time reading cards about utilitarianism that will get you access to all of your offense. I think of every framing contention, you should prioritize risk assessment more so than any of the other two categories because it has the highest diversity of warrants. However, you wanna be cognizant about your advantage. Don't skimp. You need to solve an impact before winning which impact we should care about. So let's say we were to build a framing contention, but we had a hard limit of only five cards, which is a lot more generous than the average framing contention, but a lot more narrow than a really extensive full advantage framing contention. Here are the cards that I would exclude, include just based off of a quick summary of what we've talked about so far. First, a card about the conjunctive fallacy, probably Kinet in 98. Second, a card about existential moderation, that says that incremental improvements in life, access to future generations, and decrease, decrease the likelihood of existential risk. This could be the Kaxmarek card that we talked about. Third, probability ceilings. This is the Simpson evidence. It says the risk of every DA ever combined is only 0.2%. Fourth, existential risk framing causes decision paralysis because we're incentivized to inflate magnitude since probability can only ever go from zero to 100, but magnitude can go up to infinite. That makes taking action impossible since any action could relate to a high magnitude impact. Fifth, no war. Fet Y17, as just discussed.
However, this is a recommendation, but it's not an absolute ideal. No framing contention is the same. While all can follow some general guidelines, you should make sure you tailor your strategy and modify framing to fit your app. For instance, if your affirmative links to large disadvantages, like if you were reading the Saudi Arabia affirmative from last year, or a decriminalization affirmative from this year, you should include an ethics argument, because util is likely to be too easy for the negative. If utilitarianism is the framework that we should adopt, the negative's disadvantage almost certainly outweighs the case. If your affirmative relies on foreign actors or a complicated solvency mechanism, as touched upon earlier, then de-emphasized predictions fail, since they apply to our solvency as well. If you know the negative likes to go for a specific DA, let's say a warming DA, you can include critiques of the warming DA in your 1AC, like apocalyptic representations of warming bad. If you know the negative goes for the K, you can remove impact defense, since it won't help, since there won't be a DA, and add defenses of your method, like pragmatism good, fiat good, legal skills, and framework good. All of these things are important to remember because they help keep in mind the two cardinal advantages of soft left apps. Truth, the fact that most of these apps are genuinely good ideas, and modularity, the fact that soft left apps have sort of a plug and play element to them where a framing contention can answer almost any negative strategy. Here are some arguments that I think you should deliberately avoid. One is ethical tautologies. We covered this earlier, but arguments that are self-referential or circular. So we should prioritize justice because to not do so would be unjust. Critiques. I'm personally not a big fan of Ks about security logic or discourse in the 1AC. They open you up to negative critiques since you've now conceded representation matters. They admit that not only the plan matters, so the negative can pick out of them or impact turn them. And they tend not to be about the specific disadvantage, which mitigates how good they are. I think that impact defense with the same impact as the disadvantage is also non-strategic. For example, imagine if reading if you read an economic interdependence impact or impact defense that said wars are unlikely because countries are economically dependent, they won't shoot their suppliers, and then I read the tax reform DA or the tariffs DA or some disad with the same impact as your impact defense, you've essentially read an impact card for the negative. I would admit the phrase backburner. You might have heard from a lot of soft left debates that a given impact is important because existential risks push it onto the backburner. But this argument is circular. If X is less important than Y, then X should in fact be deprioritized. If violence against immigrants is less important than preventing extinction, we should in fact deprioritize violence against immigrants relative to extinction. I would also admit structural violence first or root cause. I mentioned this earlier with the Cezentis evidence, but it implicitly concedes sufficiency framing and also exposes you to turn case since the disadvantage likely has a larger internal link to structural violence and you certainly don't solve all of it. So it's difficult to argue against the counter plan for not solving all of the affirmative. Now we'll move on to discussing some answers to common negative arguments that I think give soft left app teams the most trouble. One of the most frustrating negative objections to answer is essentially the demand for a probability threshold. This involves an appeal for arbitrariness. The negative will argue that probability times magnitude is the most mathematically objective standard and thus the only fair one to adopt. Answering the question, how low is no risk? At what point is an impact improbable? How much probability does the judge have to consider? Often involves agreeing with the fact that soft left apps can win under probability times magnitude. The best answer to this question, in my opinion, is that we should discount risks that are indistinct from statistical noise. The negative needs to prove a relationship between the app and their disadvantage that is more significant than background factors. This is in some ways still arbitrary because the negative will say, well, okay, what's statistical noise? How do you know when something is indistinct from it? And so your argument should be that every disadvantage has several, several background factors that affect its probability of being true. Elections is a question of poll accuracy and whether or not pundits are astute enough, what swing states are being campaigned in, where rallies are held, etc. Those are all background factors that establish a statistical baseline for how likely the disadvantage is. The negative needs to prove the relationship is distinct from those background factors and has a discrete, discrete statistically significant impact. The affirmative should point out that probability times magnitude is equally arbitrary and creates an incentive to inflate the latter. You can never have probability higher than 100 because it's at 0 to 100, but magnitude is 0 to theoretically infinite, so it creates a perverse race where negative teams just tout up the magnitude of their impacts without providing justifications for them, which links to the affirmative's offense.
Another common line of negative criticism is the argument made by Nick Bostrom that extinction is more valuable than just 7 billion because it includes the possibility for future generations. The total number of future generations vastly outweighs any minor benefit to the affirmative. There are a few answers you can make to this. One is counting future generations proves the infinitarian paralysis. Accounting for 500 trillion future generations is functionally infinite and makes logical decision making impossible. Even in 0.01% of 500 trillion is a ton. So we'd have to consider every action that could possibly affect the probability that 500 lives are born in the future or 500 trillion lives are born in the future. Second, the app should say that you should discount future generations because the value to life is based on consciousness and pain. It's the transition from life to death, not the creation of new life. Finally, the negative can also critique the framing of future generations. They can say it justifies pro-life anti-abortion logic and forced reproduction, since that would maximize the number of future lives. Another common line of attack versus soft left apps is the argument that even if the app is right in an abstract theoretical sense, this is debate. And hey, dropped arguments are true, which means that any internal link claim or any specific technical claim not explicit by the app should be maximally persuasive. There are a few things the app should do to recover from this. First, they should make the argument that if the burden is on the affirmative to not drop an argument and cover every possible component of the disadvantage, the reciprocal burden is on the disadvantage. They have to rebut the specific nature of the app's probability arguments. Second, the affirmative should make a delineation between omitted arguments and dropped arguments saying that not mentioning an argument is analogous to dropping the magnitude of the disadvantage, falls prey to cognitive biases, and, as mentioned earlier, encourages teams to inflate the risk of their disadvantage. Finally, no link. We didn't drop the disadvantage. We actually introduced arguments about holistic risk ass assessment. I think the answers to AT dropped arguments are true are telling because they reveal the fact that soft left apps need to prioritize rebutting appeals to specificity. The negative will say, hey, if our dissent is so improbable, prove it. Tell us why. It should be easy, right? It is easy. The soft left app should capitalize on this and list out the theoretically infinite and analytical takeouts to the disadvantage. This should be straightforward. If the negative reads a dissent about military readiness, talk about sequestration, proposed budget cuts, the Veterans Caucus in Congress, different weapon systems, hypersonics, etc., Mentioning analytics distances your affirmative from that statistical background noise and makes it so you're not dropping arguments when answering the disadvantage itself. The negative can also point to a series of alternative biases to rebut the app's claim that we're biased towards extinction. One of these is scope neglect, which is the argument that we're bad at conceptualizing differences in scale and size between impacts. One million and one billion don't really resonate that differently between us let alone 1 million and 500 trillion or all possible future generations. The answer to scope neglect should be one, scope neglect causes the underestimation of the cumulative effects wrought by systemic harms. If we try to correct scope neglect by only focusing on extinction, we'll overlook the systemic problems that are driving those risks in the first place. Second is no link, conjunction fallacy, good story bias, and negativity bias i.e. all the biases that suggest you're more likely to focus on existential risk outweigh the assertion that we're unable to estimate existential risk properly. Next is the availability heuristic, which is the argument that we're biased towards impacts that are the most available to us or the ones that are easiest to recall and at the forefront of our memory. The app's answer should be several fold. One, term. In debate, existential impacts are more available than systemic ones. So the availability heuristic is a reason to discount extinction scenarios and error affirmative. Second, no link. If an impact is ongoing, it has a 100% probability by definition. That's not a bias. It's a fact that describes the status quo. The next set of arguments that is important for affirmatives to answer is Turn's case. If the negative wins that the affirmative makes their own impact scenarios worse, can't solve the advantage, or links to their framing, they will likely win the debate. Thus, it's imperative you answer Turn's case. First, you should say no link. Turn's case is a function of the disadvantage's overall probability. It might be true the election impact warming turns racial inequality, but that relies on them winning every step of the DA up until warming. Second, it's not unique. The disadvantage cannot turn a systemic harm because that systemic harm occurs now. It is try or die for solving it. Relative increases in how bad it is don't make that much difference.
Lastly, no link. The affirmative solves our harms, which prevents the disadvantage from terminating them or from turning them. If the affirmative sufficiently solves racism, it's almost impossible for the night to read a DA that says the app makes racism worse. Soft left apps can struggle when answering some of these arguments because they have to overcome debate's sacred cow, the church of try or die, the cult of zero risk, and the religion of turns case. Judges will use soft left apps as an excuse and they will claim that they're really just a lazy tactic to avoid debating the disadvantage. To combat this, you should simply answer the disadvantage, like I explained before, and apply your bias arguments when appropriate. That's it. I hope this lecture has given you a good overview of how to debate soft left framing on the affirmative. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Google forum or attend the Q&A on Saturday evening, where myself and another Michigan debater, Brandon Strauss, will be discussing some of the particulars of soft left framing and answering your questions specifically. If there's anything else that I missed that you think is too tough to ask in a Q&A, feel free to back channel your lab leaders or reach out to any staff member at the camp provided you follow the rule of three with more questions. Also, make sure you watch Scott Phillips's lecture on Sunday evening as he'll cover the negative side. And since the pairing's 50-50, you need to know how to rebut these most common arguments. So I hope this helped and I hope you learned how to make a better soft left aft framing contention and how to debate and explain some of the disadvantages and advantages to existential risk framing.